we're going to be talking about there is no sustainability <laughs> problem in FOSS, except that there is. Um, uh, I'm Dwayne O'Brien. I am the head of open source at Indeed, uh, and I'm co-presenting today with Carol. And I'm Carol Smith, and I'm uh, with Microsoft in the open source programs office as a PM. All right. Does that look like I'm sharing all right? Yeah. OK. Uh, yeah, da, da, da. There we are. So do you want to kick off the, the primary subject? Yeah. Uh, so what we're talking today about is something that uh, a lot of you have probably heard about in, uh, in the course of your work or your experience in FOSS in some way. Um, and as we've seen, there's, uh, there's a lot of headlines. There's a lot of talk about it, uh, this word sustainability. Um, and in a lot of this discussion, there seems to be uh, an implication that this is something that's um, quite important for us to focus on. This is a problem. Um, and uh, the implication is that there's also, uh, by framing it as a problem, that there's also a solution and that um, we should be talking about uh, what this problem is and, and how we could potentially be solving it. Um, and it's something that people are uh, fearful of. Uh, it's on people's minds. Uh, people really want to want to find a solution because it's something that we need to be um, worried about. And so we wanted to talk today about about what this actually is and, and what it means. And sustainability is a subject that people have been talking about for a while. It's, it might be a little hard to see depending on uh, the screen resolution, but that open source and sustainability article um, written by the OSI, uh, the open source initiative down in the bottom right corner, uh, was penned in 2008. So it's been a subject for, for quite a while. Uh, before we jump in, um, we'd like to ask the participants to post into chat. When, when, we say, uh, when we say sustainability, what does sustainability mean to you? Or what, is, what do you think about when you, when you hear uh, people talk about sustainability as it relates to open source? And we'll give people a couple of moments to, to respond in chat and we'll read the answers off as we see them. Uh, uh, long-term success uh, is one observation from an attendee. Uh, not being able to revoke contributions, that's an interesting one from another uh, um, uh, attendee. Uh, survival uh, comes up. Uh, thank you, uh, Dorothy. Uh, sustained by contributors. Uh, money is a, is a subject that comes up uh, frequently in these conversations. The ability of participants to support the project while making a decent living uh, certainly uh, is, is another way to say that. Um, and and these, these last two, Duane, um, there, come, there comes a, an implication or a subtext that um, resources is something that's involved in it, that you need um, either time or money or, or um, the ability to uh, to to sustain yourself in some way, either through um, development time or, or money. Yes, and, and one last one, and then we'll move on from this slide. Uh, to me, sustainability means the project continues to be supported for its users over the long term. And what's interesting about the, the comments that we got from the attendees and the comments that we get when we give this talk is that no two people really give the same answer uh, and that sustainability uh, appears to have many different definitions for folks. And that's uh, and that's part of the uh, the problem or the the issue that we're we're raising here is that there isn't a consistent uh, definition. Uh, there's people say sustainability and um, they kind of mean it as this umbrella term that is meant to uh, reference a lot of different things or evoke a certain feeling in a person or or um, a sh or a shared understanding. Although there is no shared understanding. Um, and that uh, we say sustainability problem and we mean that there's a sustainability solution as well. But there is in fact uh, not one single problem or one single solution here. So what we're gonna do over the course of the talk is we're gonna look at some specific case studies uh, of events that sometimes come up in the conversation around sustainability as it relates to free and open source software. Uh, and we're going to look at each of them and and talk about if they are a sustainability problem or if they are a different kind of problem. Uh, we will talk about some other things that uh, sometimes get lumped in with the sustainability conversation uh, and that can help us to talk about them more meaningfully if we break them out. And then we'll talk about work that we're doing at our respective organizations uh, to try to do our part to take a, a, a position in, in taking on sustainability. So. Uh, the first 
the first case study we're going to talk about is left pad. So the shortest version of the story that I can give for left pad was there was a developer who had some NPM packages. Uh, they got very angry with NPM uh, and they decided to quit. They took all of their NPM packages down. Uh, they deleted their projects from NPM and we saw some of the headlines uh, earlier. Uh, you know, one developer nearly broke the internet with 11 lines of JavaScript. So this developer took down all his published packages, uh, a bunch of things broke. Uh, Carol, would you describe this as a sustainability problem? Uh, so no, I would not. But um, I think the important thing here is that um, this was the, the the headline here was this is a, this is eleven lines of code and it, br it broke the internet. It didn't really break the internet, but a lot a lot of people were were affected by this. Um, but these are all cases where uh, people or enterprises or organizations or individual developers, whatever the case may be, took a dependency on this thing that was on the public internet. These eleven lines of code that were on the public internet. And we're depending on it in a um, in a production setting, and uh, and then when it went down, uh, they didn't have it anymore. And that was a business decision that those folks made uh, that had had uh, nothing to do with with whether or not the uh, the person the person who made the npm package had enough time or resources or development. Uh, that was a that was a decision that those those folks made, and and then maybe they were kicking themselves for for having made because they took a dependency on something uh, that then was able to take them down. Uh, but um, applying more time or money or resources to uh, to that developer to that person uh, would not have fixed the the business process the business uh, issue that uh, that those folks uh, ran into once uh, their dependency was was taken down. And and. Also worth noting was that the uh, left pad wasn't even the the package that was at the core of the of the dispute that the developer was having with NPM and, and the nature of the dispute was there was a uh, there was a trademark in play there was a company who owned a trademark then the developer was sitting in the in the that trademark's namespace and NPM had no choice but to come down on the side of the trademark holder um, and it originally started off because of an unrelated package when the developer took down all of their packages. Um, suddenly, it magnified this this significant problem that that we had propagated throughout the ecosystem. Clearly, we learned something though from LeftPad because it, a few years later we wound up with uh, with EventStream. So, uh, EventStream uh, was another uh, npm package, and the shortest version of of this story is that there was a fairly stable node module. It hadn't changed in a while. Uh, the maintainer was no longer interested in maintaining um, uh, event stream. Uh, a stranger showed up, they made a couple of contributions into the project uh, and offered to take it over. Uh, the maintainer said sure, and then the, the, the new maintainer uh, injected some crypto stealing code or crypto mining code uh, into the event stream package and it was you know, then published. Uh, so Carol, was this a sustainability problem? Um, also not, uh, but for, for different reasons. In this case, um, what we're talking about is kind of uh, divested responsibility. So, so uh, folks, uh, so uh, folks on the internet, uh, in this case, do uh, have a dependency on this as well. But, um, but again, the maintainer, uh, given more time, energy, money, resources, more, more development time, uh, this would not have have uh, affected this. This is a security problem. Uh, maybe this is uh, maybe this is again. Uh, we should we should talk about how um, we could lessen the effect of a uh, malicious uh, package getting getting out there or or affecting folks. Um, but applying more time, money, or resources to to this uh, to this situation probably would not would not have have helped it either. Uh, although uh, you know. We, we could talk uh, and we will in later slides about um, whether more security research and uh, vulnerability um, research would have helped. And it's also worth calling out with relation to event stream that if, if this was a, a bad bad faith action, right? If the, if, if the maintainer uh, who owned this mature node module had decided intentionally, I, I would like to use you know my, my node module footprint to inject crypto code uh, across the ecosystem, nothing would have prevented them from doing that. We were more or less taking it on on, on good faith that, that maintainers wouldn't do this. So nothing would have been prevented um, 
uh, or would have prevented someone from from acting as a bad actor in this particular case. Uh, and so let's talk a little bit more about. Uh, actually, I want to come. I want to come back for a second. Um, I when the after this uh, event stream issue occurred, uh, there was a, a post by the maintainer where they were talking about uh, sort of their response to the whole thing. And it, in, in a sense, I thought their response fell short because they were pushing responsibility off to, to the folks who had taken the dependency and sort of appealed to the idea that, you know, this was, I wasn't being paid to maintain this. Uh, I, you know, th this is kind of, you know, what this is, this is what you get for free, right? Um, and uh, I, I felt like took a bit of an arm's length um, approach to his his own responsibility in that uh, in that scenario um, and tried to make the problem into someone else's problem. I do think the maintainer bore some amount of responsibility for the decision that was made to hand this package over to a maintainer without vetting them. So there, there was some personal responsibility in there as well. Well, and this is this is also interesting, Dwayne, because there, I think we are we, we would draw a distinction between responsibility and sustainability. Uh, we we seem there seems to be a subtext when we say sustainability that we mean that everyone will be acting in good faith all of the time as well, and that we expect that if the if the ecosystem is working correctly, uh, that that all folks will do will always do the right thing with a capital R and a capital T, um, and and uh, and that's I, I think we're drawing a distinction there, and and the fact that. Um, there will still we still have to accept that there will be people who act act in bad faith who um, make the wrong decisions or make decisions that we just disagree with and that uh, the ecosystem has to be able to uh, to accommodate that but that that might be that th th those, are, those are separate things from um, making a project um, easier to maintain or having developers who aren't stressed out or having enough money and resources to um, to do work in, in FOSS that you're interested in doing on a day-to-day -day basis. So let's go on to talk a little bit about event stream. So, uh, sorry, not event stream, heart bleed. Heart bleed. <laughs> sorry, as predicted, the garbage trucks are outside, literally outside my office right now. So it's, it's I'm trying to manage two things at the same time. I hope they're not coming through the mic. Um, so uh, heart bleed, there is a, a widely used open source library. It has an undiscovered vulnerability that lay dormant for a couple of years. Uh, and discovery of the vulnerability leads to a large scale up, uh, upgrade effort, hundreds of thousands of public web servers uh, that needed to get uh, updated. And in the process of digging into the problem uh, really highlighted that uh, the library was largely volunteer maintained famously uh, by two guys named Steve uh, was, was the catchy headline that was going around for a while. Uh, Carol was Heartbleed uh, the the result of a sustainability problem. Um, the of the three cases that we've presented, I, I suppose this is probably one, one that's closer to a sustainability problem in that um, this is a case of of interdependency, and so um, it, and, and in this case, uh, this might have been discovered if we had, for example, applied more resources. Um, time and or money and or development work on trying to find the security vulnerability. It's also possible uh, it might not have been. And so uh, this is, I, I think, falls into a bit of a, a gray area here. Um, as, as you said, it was maintained by two guys named Steve. So maybe if it had had more maintainers who were able to fork it, focus on a wider uh, set of issues within the within the project, they had been able to do more, more research and, uh, possibly. Uh, so, so of the three, this is this probably falls a little bit more into the, the sustainability category, um, but also possibly not. Uh, and so, uh, I think we need to also consider kind of these gray area cases where, um, even with more time, money, resources, uh, even if we had all accepted that we're all uh, very uh, interdependent, uh, it still may not have have solved the problem, may not have have uh, fixed it, but um, it's it's certainly it's possible. And and the interdependency here is is like points us toward the overall solution to things that really are sustainability problems. There, there's there's so much that we depend on and so much interdependency in the system that it's that it's not something any one or two or few organizations that can can take on. We as a whole community need to have robust processes and robust practices in place. Um, so that we can make sure that all of these interdependent um, 
libraries and dependencies and modules and frameworks uh, have the support that they need. Uh, and working together is, is really important here. Uh, by way of example, um, if you work in an open source program office like, like Carol or I do, uh, you spend a lot of time uh, inevitably uh, dealing with the issue of inventory and compliance. You need to know which software that you're running, which libraries that you're dependent on and, and understand what your license obligations are. Um, and you get a good view into the dependencies that are used by your organization. Um, and, and even in a modestly sized organization, that can be tens and thousands of, of direct dependencies that are used by software that you build, applications that you deploy to production, um, and it's a lot to, to keep track of. And looking at all of them is very, very challenging. There's a lot of signal to noise. Uh, and um, filtering that is, is a tough problem. Uh, and it's, it's one that I think we're still working to solve collectively as a community. Um, so let's uh, talk a little bit about uh, PyPI. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll lead into this one um, uh, a little bit. So, uh, in 2017, the, the PyPI code base was old. It was volunteer run. Um, they were working on a sort of a, a new um, uh, underpinning for PyPI called uh, Warehouse. There was a lot of questions about when's it going to be released. They needed some help. Uh, and the Mozilla Open Source Support Program uh, issued a $170,000 grant um, to help address the sustainability of the project. Uh, and then in 2018, as a result of that funding, PyPI was able to relaunch powered by this new warehouse code base. And it went further from that, you know, there were subsequent grants that allowed them to add some additional security features to PyPI, two-factor authentication, improving the web interface for users th with disabilities, making it more accessible, adding locale support and more security focused features, overhauling the PIP user experience and dependency resolver. Um, Carol, was this a sustainability problem? So yeah, so in the, in this case, this is um, a, a case where we actually do think like they were able to, they had sustainability problems, they had problems that they wanted to solve within their with their project, and a grant was made uh, of money uh, to to help them uh, fix these things to solve solve these problems. And yes, this was this was a case where uh, they were able to take take money, translate it to, into uh, resources and development time, and and use it to. Uh, to solve some of the fix some of the things they were they were interested in working on, uh, we can't unfortunately do the counterfactual that if they hadn't received the, this money, would some problem have uh, ended up surfacing? But uh, but in this case, uh, we can take this as uh, this was a case where actually uh, yes, money was able to to be uh, applied and and problems were able to be solved and potentially problems were able to be avoided in this case. So when we say there is no sustainability in in problem in FOSS except that there is the problem isn't that there 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 is only one sustainability problem there are a lot of different things that sometimes get conflated with sustainability problems um are there any of these in particular carol that you want to speak to um well i i think they're all they're all interesting for different reasons um as we've said uh people are using this one uh, blanket umbrella term to to mean a lot of different things. So uh, in some cases, uh, we have maintainers who we have a single maintainer who is maintaining a single project that uh, the entire internet depends on that big enterprises depend on. And, uh, and so, and they're not setting uh, boundaries well. And so uh, they're working 16, 20 hour days every day, because uh, they're the only person who's maintaining uh, this project. And, um, and it, in this case, maybe they're choosing to, to do that. Maybe they're not, but uh, you know, uh, if we gave them more, uh, more maintainers, more, more people, uh, would, would they take them? Would it help? Um, and, and boundary setting is a problem. Um, and then uh, sort of the other side of that is, is resourcing where uh, basically uh, projects just grow and grow and grow and they don't have enough maintainers or they don't have, just ha don't have enough uh, people in the community to support the ongoing uh, PRs and issues that are, that are getting created. Uh, and, and that is sustainability in a, in a different way and, and uh, could, could also be a problem. Yeah. Go ahead, Dwayne. And I, and I, I think it's important to call out here that, that as a maintainer, if you are you know, working at a job that isn't supporting you as a maintainer and you're maintaining your projects in your own personal time, 
you don't have an obligation to say yes. And, and boundary setting to make sure that you have a healthy work-life balance is, is important. It is important to you. It is important to your health. It is important for the project. So um, you, you hear sometimes about maintainers who are really struggling to, to balance an eight-hour job and then all these maintainer responsibilities. If your job isn't going to support you as a maintainer, A, like find somebody to, to work for that will because we're out there. Um, but B, you know, start saying no in your project and claim back some of your time uh, because that time belongs to you and you should be willing and able to use it how you want. Um, there's also, you know, sort of a, a lot of conversation about the amount that companies give back in relation to what they're taking from the open source community. It is important that companies give back in proportion to what they're getting, right? Um, and so, uh, sometimes uh, the problems that arise or that manifest in these projects are a result from a wide, wide user base that is making feature requests but not putting any particular skin in the game, whether it's financial support or showing up as additional maintainers and contributors to the project. So if your company is benefiting from open source, you should be sure that you're giving back in proportion to the benefit that you're receiving. Um, I talked a little bit earlier about the signal to noise and the and the dependencies that are uh, that are in our respective organizations. Uh, if there are tens of thousands of direct dependencies that uh, are all looking for help, how do I know which ones are the most important to help? Like I can probably make a a pretty good uh, assessment of which which projects are the most important to my organization if they're in the top ten or in the top twenty. Uh, in the top thousand, that's a little harder, uh, and you know, am I, do I give them all $10,000? We know that's not financially, you know, feasible for most organizations. So really um, doing work as a community to help understand which dependencies will benefit the most from, um, uh, from our support and what kind of support they want uh, when, it, when it comes to that. Um, a lot of projects we know don't actually want significant funds. They'd be perfectly happy with $5 for a cup of coffee or they would rather have somebody show up and, and write code uh, than have someone show up and write a check. And if um, I could just jump in there, Dwayne, yes. uh, that's a, a, re a really good point as well because um, I think uh, a lot of the conversation here is like, we're, we're trying to uh, give money or contribute upstream in order to avoid problems like a left, a left pad or an event stream. Uh, and that the, those two shouldn't be drawn so so closely together. It may not be that the project um, wants the 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 money or the resources, um, and and you're not going you're never going to avoid a developer getting angry and pulling their npm packages uh, off the web. So so do it because it's the right thing to do, or because you're you want to support your dependencies, not because you want to draw a close distinction a close um, relationship between. Uh, your money and your contributions, and we're never going to run into a sustainability problem ever again. Thank you. Um, the last point on here, I want to speak to very briefly before we, we go on and talk about ways that we are trying to take on this problem in our own organization, and, that, and that's uh, bad planning. Um, and what I mean by bad planning here is organizations that prioritize new feature work over supporting the features and the projects that they have already deployed. So if you, uh, if your organization is adopting open source technologies in order to help deploy products to market faster, which is very common, um, and you're not building into any of your future planning, the long-term support for those um, open source dependencies that have helped you get there, um, whether it's simply making sure that you're staying on top of maintenance and updates or making sure that those projects are going to be sustainable for long term, your priorities are a little off, right? Like you're prioritizing new feature development over long term support and, and you need both. Uh, you, your organization won't be able to grow without it. Um, if you only take one thing away from the presentation today, um, I would, we want it to be this slide, right? Like if you paint everything with the broad brush saying, oh, it's, it's a sustainability problem. Sorry, I just hit my mic. It's a sustainability problem. Um, it's very hard to have specific conversations about what the problems really are. So whenever you are in a conversation and people say, this is a sustainability problem, ask, what do you mean by sustainability? And call back to that slide that we had earlier. Where we said, what does it mean to you? Uh, and uh, we all had different definitions. Um, now I wanna, I wanna pause just for a second and say, I see some activity in the chat. I see a question in the Q&A. We will have a Q&A portion here coming up in a few minutes and we'll take those on. So 
Um, if you have questions, feel free to start seeding those questions in uh, and we'll take them on uh, as we come into the next bit. <laughs> so um, let's talk about doing your part. Um, uh, to call back to this slide, I really we're going to focus on these two aspects of, of the sustainability problems, under-resourcing projects that have grown faster than their supports, and lack of participation corporate users uh, with limited returns to the project. Uh, and these are uh, particular areas where Carol and I are, are both involved uh, in our organizations. No one problem could address all of these um, specific facets of the sustainability um, conversation, um, but we're going to focus on these two. Um, and so this is going to focus primarily around uh, the FOSS Contributor Fund program. Uh, a quick overview of what that uh, is, is it is a, is a pool of funds that you set aside to sustain, uh, to support your open source dependencies. Um, and you distribute those funds by establishing a criteria that determines which dependencies are eligible. Uh, you ask your members of your organization which ones uh, you, they think should be funded, and then you hold a vote um, between the FOSS contributors within your organization. So everybody who makes an open source contribution gets to vote on, on where those funds go. Um, we want to acknowledge that money is not a substitute for other resources or time, um, but it is often uh, a, an easier thing for companies to bring to the table than developer time. Uh, and by aligning uh, the, the ability to vote with your participation in open source communities, it can also encourage you to, to get involved there. Uh, I've added a link here that will take you to uh, the basic FOSS Contributor Fund document up on GitHub uh, that describes the framework for the program. Um, Carol, anything you want to add here before uh, we talk about what it's like at Indeed? Yeah, uh, just, yeah, I mean, so you sl we've sliced down kind of the sustainability conversation just to uh, resourcing and, and participation. And now we're even slicing within within that conversation to say like, this is not, this is, doesn't even address, fully address even those two topics. This is just one, one small slice of uh, things that organizations can do. And again, yeah, money is not a solution uh, or a substitute, but this is, this is one thing that uh, we can do as part of the much, much broader conversation that has, has uh, many different facets to it. So the FOSS contributor funded at Indeed, uh, the way that it works is we hold votes once a month. Um, anyone at Indeed is eligible to nominate a project um, and projects are eligible if they are in use at Indeed, if they're not employee owned, if they use an OSI approved license and they have some way to receive funds. And when I say the project has to be in use at Indeed, that might mean it's a piece of infrastructure. It might mean it's a framework that we use to deploy applications, could be a direct dependency, could be the software that IT uses to image new laptops for, for new hires. It just has to be used somewhere. Um, the project that gets selected um, by uh, open source contributors uh, receives $10,000. And to date, we funded 21 projects uh, with over $200,000 uh, pushed into uh, the open source ecosystem through our FOSS contributor fund. Over what time frame was that, Dwayne? Oh, thank you. Yes, the, uh, we started that at the beginning of 2019. So we're just uh, approaching the end of our second year. Uh, yeah, and so Microsoft started a uh, program for FOSS contributing as well that is modeled after Indeed's program, and we have been running it for a much shorter uh, time, which is why I, I uh, wanted to, to draw the distinction between uh, uh, Microsoft and Indeed's programs. Uh, Microsoft's been running this for about about four months now. Um, so we have funded three projects so far, but it's the same It's the same model, which is it needs to be something that's, uh, that Microsoft uses, uh, which is a, a, a broad category of things and, and includes uh, many, many, many different kinds of projects um, and also needs to be uh, under an OSI approved license and, and uh, not uh, maintained by anyone at Microsoft. Uh, but uh, we also take, um, uh, nom nominations for projects from from employees, and then we actually have an, an eligibility for uh, for voting that we base on whether or not a, an employee has contributed to a open source project in the last uh, in the last time frame. So in the last thirty days, uh, you become eligible if you've made a contribution externally. You become eligible to vote if you've made a contribution externally, uh, and then you can vote on the projects that have been nominated for that uh, time period. Uh, so it, it, it is meant to not only uh, 
encourage uh, our contributions to these projects that we rely on, but also to encourage Microsoft employees to contribute in order to become eligible to vote and to participate in the open, open source ecosystem uh, as a whole. And, and as you see, uh, we've th funded three projects so far, but it's the same, uh, same model as Indeed's. And we, we've both used the word contribution here, um, maybe a little slop, sloppily, but um, I believe, and Carol, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong here, I believe we, like both of our organizations take a very broad view of what contribution means here. It is not necessarily just a pull request. It does not necessarily just a code contribution. Um, in, in our case, um, it, it can be as simple as commenting on a bug, upvoting a bug, registering a bug with, with a project that we use. Um, that is, when you ask, main, whenever I have asked maintainers, I should say, um, what is the simplest and most easy contribution someone can make to your project? Consistently, the answer I get is file bugs, right? Like, tell us when you find an issue, don't complain about it on Twitter, because we'll never see it. Um, is yes, that we, we, about how you yes, do it? Yes, we, we do have a much, uh, an expansive view. It's, it is definitely not just code. It is also participating in conversations and issues and, and other things like that as well. So it's um, a much, bro much broader than, than just code PRs. And, and, and really at the, at the heart of the, uh, the intention behind the program in both of our organizations uh, is not just to drive financial support into um, our own dependencies, although it is an important part, it is to get people involved in contributing to open source as well. Uh, because showing up as contributors and helping to maintain and support these dependencies is, is the way that we take on the broad, broad topic of sustainability and its many facets. So um, with that, uh, I will um, take us into the question slide and Carol, do you want to read the back chat read the q a or field questions which which, which one would you uh, wait well we have one we have one question in q a so i can read that one Great. and then we can uh we can see um if if there's more uh questions that surface in chat or in the meanwhile so uh the question in q a is uh how do you continue to support a project you love and support yourself uh, who are you answering to? How can you broach this subject and share your feels, uh, blogs, meetings, uh, et cetera? Um, so I, I assume this is taking the perspective of how do you, as a person who's who's just an individual developer, uh, continue to support uh, projects you love in, individually? Um, so Dwayne, you have any uh, thoughts on that? Interesting. I, I, I heard that as a little differently. I heard that as I am I am an individual developer who is maintaining a project, but I also need to make a living. Um, uh, and if that is the, the nature of the way the question was asked, it's if, if you don't have a project that has gotten to the point that people are able to pay you for support, either through GitHub sponsors, through Open Collective or something like that, um, there are many organizations that uh, will employ you as an open source contributor uh, and support your work for supporting and maintaining that project, but also ask you to do work for, for them. It's a very common pattern uh, in the industry. Um, you know, sometimes uh, uh, it is about hiring uh, maintainers of dependencies the organization uses. So if you know who your users are, um, find, finding work with uh, some of them can, can also help. But there are other organizations that are a little more um, liberally minded when it, when it comes to this and, and are happy to, to employ you in a sort of a split time uh, arrangement. Uh, Carol, do you have other thoughts? Uh, no, I think that's, I think that's good. I mean, I think it probably, um, there's, there's nuance here depending on when you started the project, why you started the project, is it this labor of love for you or is it, is it a more transactional, you, you'd really like uh, more people to be using it and, and you'd like to make, make it a business, make money on it. Um, how many people rely on it? How many people are in your community? Do you have um, colleagues who are maintainers? Is it really just you? Um, so those, those are important questions. I, uh, I, I think, but I mean, yeah, I, it, it, as a general thing, it is uh, difficult to, to surface yourself as a, as a small project that a lot of folks um, rely on, but um, absolutely blogs, um, meetings with folks, uh, work, working your network is important. Um, but yeah, I think, I think you covered it, Dwayne. Uh, I'll, I'll call out a, a, a comment from the chat as we're working our way um, through the backlog. Uh, it's sad when open source maintainers blame the very nature of open source. We need to be uplifting open source, not tearing it down. 100% agree. Um, I, you know, maintainer frustration is is a real thing, and I have empathy for for that. Um, 
I want to understand which maintainers of our dependencies need help so that we can show up and help in meaningful ways um, before they get to the point that they just get angry that at open source and open source is broken. Um, it is it is more of that signal to noise pr uh, problem um, from my perspective. Um, what if every project required a second like Emotion does and if someone's not willing to sponsor co-design the loan, so to speak, it doesn't go forward. Um, that, that, that is sort of a governance question, not so much a sustainability question, but it's an interesting one. Carol, any thoughts? Um, I mean, the, I guess this is more, this is, yeah, this is more an interdependency problem maybe, or a, um, like we're, we're all kind of in it together and, and some people are just not going to act, act uh, in good faith or in the way that, that we expect them to, or, or do the right thing with a capital R and a capital T. Um, I, I actually, I don't know if I have a good, a good answer to that. <laughs> it's a tough problem. <laughs> it is. Um, there, there was some good conversation and some back and forth in the chat about the, the role of patronage um, uh, in, in this scenario. Uh, if you are relying on a wealthy patron to write a check to sustain you, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Um, and I, I apologize to folks who are participating in that conversation because I'm still also trying to parse the, 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 the back thread for it. So um, I think that my personal opinion here is that, that patronage by itself is not a, a long-term solution to any of the problems that have a sustainability facet to them, right? Um, it is a good place to start for organizations who are not involved right now. And I, I see this very much as a uh, as a process, if you work at an organization who uses open source and isn't doing anything to support it, you can start with patronage or you can start with just getting people encouraged to contribute and getting permission for people to contribute. Um, and once you're there, what's the next best thing that you can do and, and go forward from there? Um, Carol, any thoughts? Uh, no, but we do have another question in the Q&A, so I'll uh, read that. Uh, often knowing how to look for and taking time to build a platform to get support is difficult and maybe uh, alien skills, uh, different skills. Um, have any efforts to, to, make, to make the kinds of programs you mentioned as open platforms uh, that a project can adopt without having to be experts themselves or having those sorts of experts in the community? Um, I don't think I'm quite parsing this question, sorry. Uh, I'm, I'm also reading it myself here. So have any efforts to making kinds of programs and missions and having to be experts themselves. Um, uh, yeah, apologies to the to the asker there. I, I don't I don't know that I'm getting um, uh, the gist of the question either, but feel free to to add a clarification and we'll pay attention to the Q&A. Yeah. Um, what else? Oh, uh, there was there was a question also in the chat about uh, the idea that maintainers might get pushback for setting boundaries. Um, and that is an, an unfortunate reality, right? Um, there has, a, there has grown this expectation for a subset of the, uh, people who consume and use open source, uh, that, um, they can place expectations on a project, uh, without participating in it. Uh, and we see this manifest all the time in, in different ways, whether it's uh, short or curt or maybe even rude bug reports um, uh, or just unhelpful ones like this is broken, fix it. Why haven't you fixed this? Right. Um, what we can do from within our own organizations is a set good standards for how we expect people to behave when they are opening bugs in, in projects that we use uh, and b um, drive a more participatory style of, of, of working with open source projects. Uh, one of the things that we do consistently, I'll, 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 I'll speak very personally. One of the things I do consistently when, when um, someone uh, comes to uh, our program office and says, hey, like there's, there's this thing that we use. It has this open bug. It looks like the maintainer is, is MIA or they have, they have not, no longer maintaining the project. Um, we'd like to get this bug fixed or there's a pull request open to, that fixes this bug. Like, what can we do? Um, and consistently, my advice for them is to open with, is there anything that we can do to help this land, right? 
Um, so go go beyond just upvoting the problem or go beyond um, uh, saying, yes, I also have this problem or can we fix this? Offer to help and, and, and position yourself as someone who is showing up to the project, who's willing to roll up your sleeves and get involved. Um, Carol? Yeah, I've I've seen a I've seen a shade of that, Dwayne, which is um, sort of a, a a person or an organization or something uh, gets really involved in a, in a community or in a project, and then they start uh, submitting a bunch of pull requests and 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 getting active active in the in the code in the community. Uh, but then the review and the merging of the pull requests is is maybe falling behind because there's maybe one maintainer or two maintainers. Um, and then I think I think that's a matter of um, actually what we need to be doing is, in getting involved in the community is actually working with the maintainer on how can we how can we take some of the burden of the maintenance off your shoulders? How can we work with you? How can we grow ourselves to become uh, maintainers as well? Is that is that uh, in your in your long term uh, project plan uh, to to grow more maintainers, um, the sort yeah I mean as you said it like sort of the the walk up and and ex start expecting things uh, that's uh, that's just not not good uh, not not being a good community citizen uh, and and not not approaching the the problem correctly but yes I, I absolutely it is a problem for maintainers and I think. Um, I think we, we we as a community need to continue to keep it uh, top of our minds and make sure that we're we're acting act acting in the right way. Uh, we're at we're at uh, eleven minutes, so um, do we want to take one more and then uh, call it, or uh, what do you want to do here, Dwayne? Um, pretty close. Yeah, we can we we can we can take one or two more. Um, a couple of them are I think are, are easy responses. In the Q&A, uh, someone asked, what about the overall problem of multiple projects all trying to do the same thing? Shouldn't we be focused on one or two projects in each domain? They're well supported. I have so much I can say to that problem. <laughs> um, um, yes. Yes, we should be focusing on reducing the amount of duplicated effort in the open source ecosystem. It, it, is, it is a big problem in and of itself. Um, uh, how do the, the, the last question I think I'd, I'd like us to take is, is how do we rise to the challenge and say no and, and, and set boundaries? Um, uh, and in particular, helping maintainers to set good boundaries for themselves so that they can uh, uh, avoid pushback and, 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 and effectively sort of have their have the work life balance that they want. I think a thing that can help uh, is setting clear expectations for the project in the project um, in uh, both your contributing documentation and, and the other uh, artifacts that are available for the document. Make it clear what the scope of the project is, what you're willing to accept, what you're not willing to accept, what your working hours are. Um, we know not everybody will read these things, but um, there it can help to set a, a set of guidelines for how you're going to interact and work with the with the community. Um, and it can head off some of those requests that that might be out of scope for the project. Yeah, and, um, and things like uh, telling folks, um, I don't respond, I don't uh, even review PRs uh, for 30 days uh, after, you know, you know just set, it, set expectations. Um, you know, if, if you are not planning on merging any new PRs or you will only merge PRs that are of interest to you on your project, say that, just just be clear. Like, uh, I, I realize like it, it uh, some, some, I realize you will get some pushback and I, I apologize for the people in the world who, who do that. Uh, but if you set if you set the expectation up front, uh, I, they can go pound sand <laughs> when when uh, when uh, th things don't happen that they were expecting. All right, so should we uh, shall we call yeah, it here, let's, Dwayne? Let, let, let's wrap up here with with, with the last minute. I'll, I'll I'll give a final note, which is that if if you have an open source project and you know there is an organization that uses that project check and see if they have an open source program office. They're usually public about that. And if they do and you need help, reach out to them and ask for help. Like we are here within the open source program office world specifically looking for you and looking for ways to help support you. Um, and with that, I will hand it back over to the moderator and thanks everyone for coming out and for such a great set of questions.